Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I have to share my screen as well. So close. All right, now we're good. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Sam Anthony. I am the program manager with the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much tonight for joining us for the fourth event of our 2023 voter education series, Ballot Box Basics. For your awareness, this webinar is being recorded. Um, as an attendee in the webinar, your camera is turned off, so your face will not be included in the recording. Another reminder that closed captioning is available in Zoom. Um, to enable closed captions on your screen, you can click live transcript in your Zoom taskbar. If you need more assistance with closed captioning, I'll be dropping a help document in the chat right now. <clears throat> um, and if there's anything we can ever do to assist with accessibility and improve accessibility in any way for these webinars, please let us know in the chat or by sending me an email. Um, we begin our time together tonight with a land acknowledgement. Um, Colonial Pennsylvania boundaries were first drawn in 1681 over original nation's land. We in Pennsylvania acknowledge the land ownership of original and indigenous peoples honoring the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the great nations of Pennsylvania, Erie, Iroquois, Muncie, Delaware, Shawnee, Ohio Valley, Susquehannock, and Lenape. We honor all original nations of the past and those among us today. The League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Our state office oversees a grassroots network of 30 local leagues all across Pennsylvania. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. To learn more about our work and to subscribe to our action alerts, please visit our website. I'll be dropping those links in the chat as soon as I'm finished sharing slides. I am very pleased to welcome you all tonight to Ballot Box Basics, Information Every Voter Needs. We design these webinars because we know that voting, government, and elections can be very complicated. In 2023, these monthly webinars have and will discuss important topics like registering to vote, why municipal elections matter, the role of school boards and the judiciary, and the Pennsylvania closed primary system. Whether you're a first time voter or have voted in every election you were eligible for, we think you'll learn something new. To watch previous recordings of Ballot Box Basics webinars or to sign up for future events, please visit the link that I put in the chat as soon as I'm done sharing the slides. Throughout tonight's presentation, you are welcome and encouraged to ask questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. We will answer as many submitted questions as possible after the presentation. You are welcome to also engage with fellow participants in the chat, but please note that we will only be answering questions from the Q&A tool. In addition to our recording, please note that we'll also be sending a copy of the slides to all registrants. And I will now turn it over to Rochelle Kaplan, our Voter Services Co-Director, to introduce our panelists. Rochelle? Rochelle, make sure to come off mute. Yes, thank you. I would have been talking to myself. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited tonight about our program, and in particular, our terrific presenters. Eileen Olmsted and Ruth Quint, of the League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh. Eileen's current role in her local league is a producer of the weekly e-blast sent to all members of the League of Women Voters of Greater Pittsburgh. She first joined the League of Women Voters in California in 1977. We're so pleased that she came to Pennsylvania. She's been an incredible a resource for all of us. She's held many positions in the league, the presidency and directorship roles for voter services and membership. One of her proudest league roles was as a sure fellow for the National League. As a fellow for eight years, Eileen coached various leagues in best practices of how to be an effective agent for change. Eileen has a master's in library science and a master's in counseling psychology. Ruth Quint joined the League of Women Voters in 2018 to volunteer with voter services and civic education teams. A former math and technology teacher, Ruth was quickly drafted to work on the website. 
and what a website it is, and is now the webmaster for the Greater Pittsburgh League. Ruth lives and gardens in the North Hills with her husband and two sons. For many years, both Ruth and Eileen have had a passion for good government. They are committing to combating the consequences of mis- and disinformation, which has been so prevalent in the past years. I've had the good fortune to participate in the webinar that they have presented last spring. I know that you're gonna learn so very much. So I'm gonna, now gonna turn it over to Eileen and Ruth to educate all of us. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, and hello everybody out there. The League of Women Voters of the United States in partnership with Algorithmic Transparency Institute have assembled this training to help us work to address myths and disinformation spreading in our community. We attended a training session to learn about this process and now we're here to show you what we learned so we can work together to tackle this challenge. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to walk you through today's agenda so you know what we'll be covering. We will start with an overview of the landscape in which this work takes place. With that context, we will then explore how we define this complex problem, looking at the tactics, appeal, and motivation common to misleading messages. Once we establish that foundation, we will turn to thinking about when and how to engage responsibly to tackle problematic content. After we discuss response, we can talk about participation through your volunteer engagement, where we will explain how you can sign up to take an active part in collaborative action. Let's get started. Next slide, please. Misinformation spreading on social media has become a fact of life. It fuels polarization and hate. It drives down trust in institutions. It amplifies fringe science and conspiracies and it even incites violence. Every political and social issue we hope to address is now impacted by the threat of false and misleading claims that can confuse and radicalize the public. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, this is a complex problem and there is no silver bullet to solve it. Social media platforms and fact checkers can't moderate us out of this downward spiral and no act of Congress can effectively restrict the flow of misinformation that is likely to continue unabated. Next slide. Instead, building capacity within our communities to establish resilience to the impact of the misinformation is critical. If we cultivate a shared sense of civic responsibility for understanding and identifying harmful and misleading messages, and then invest energy in constructively engaging with one another, we can build the necessary bridges and find the common ground required to engage the whole of our society in an effort to improve our discourse. Next slide. We are here today to realize this idea of a whole society effort. Let's start by thinking about what that really means. It means we acknowledge that we all share a responsibility and civic duty to understand and address the misinformation corrupting our discourse. It means embracing that everyone can be affected by and contribute to this and disinformation regardless of their political perspective. It means taking responsibility for actively working to improve our public discourse by learning more effective techniques to mitigate the harm caused by mis- and disinformation. It means re recognizing that misinformation looks different in each community and we need to tackle it everywhere, not for example, just in white English speaking spaces. Much of the attention paid to the spread of misinformation has focused on majority communities and mainstream English language concerns. Effectively combating the challenges posed by mis- and disinformation means that solutions cannot be imposed from the outside. Instead, we must empower those within a community to develop approaches that will resonate with them so they are both invested in the outcome 
and are able to tailor their approach based on their unique cultural knowledge. Next slide. As we think about addressing problematic messages, it's important to start by recognizing that the information that pollutes our discourse comes in many forms. Whether we're talking about misinformation or disinformation, rumors or conspiracy theories, junk news, or even hate speech, regardless of the form, it all misleads. For our purposes, the distinction between these various forms are less critical than our awareness that in the end, the impacts they create are the main concern and the one we seek to address, regardless of the intent of the messenger or the specific language of the message. Next slide. More than anything, we must recognize that this problem is much bigger than a simple contrast between what is true and what is false. As you will see, when we go through the various forms and tactics, much of the corrosive discord sits in a gray area where things are difficult, if not impossible to verify or fact check, and where an emotional appeal is more powerful than the logical one. This means that our response strategies cannot rely on communicating facts alone, but must also tackle the appeal, motives, and context in which people share misleading ideas. Now Ruth is going to expand on those ideas. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we actually mean when we talk about problematic content? First things first, we need to acknowledge that the kinds of messages that corrupt our discourse are not always the simple and obvious examples of what we used to call fake news or simply lies. Beyond the outright falsehoods, the key areas of concern include messages that lack critical context, things like articles, statistics, charts, or even images that lack a critical piece of information might be incredibly misleading. We will label this kind of content false or missing context. Without that context, it is just as wrong and likely as harmful as the completely made up stuff. We also see lots of arguments that are based on faulty logic or an illogical premise. This is a common tactic in political rhetoric and propaganda, but we see it cropping up frequently in image-based memes and short form video content setting up a straw man to tear down, or falsely equating things that just aren't comparable corrupts our ability to build a constructive and honest discourse. We constantly see coded messages that play on stereotypes and hate. In the end, every expression of prejudice, no matter how subtle, is founded on a kernel of misinformation. Hate speech is disinformation. Conspiracy theories have been around forever but there has been a massive rise in their prevalence and diversity across social media in the past few years. At their core, conspiracy serve a role similar to some mythology to give us fantastic and exciting answers to the difficult and confusing things that impact our lives. When we can't believe that our candidate didn't win or we can't understand how the entire world shut down in a matter of weeks due to an invisible plague, Blaming powerful people with ulterior motives creates a story that matches the scale of our confusion and frustration. Finally, outdated content can be misleading even when it is totally accurate. We frequently see old content that was true at the time but gets reshared again today in a new context. When we don't know that it is old, we don't realize it is no longer relevant to the current discourse or worse, outright misleading. Above all, it is critical to recognize with each of these forms of content that it doesn't have to be false to create problems. Next slide. Before we continue, I wanna to pause to give you a warning about the upcoming slides. We are about to look at examples of real social media messages that have circulated recently. All of them contain some kind of problematic content. As you think about each of these examples, please keep in mind that they risk misleading you right now. As we go through the examples, think about the forms and tactics critically to be sure you understand how and why they are misleading. Next. Messages with false or misleading con or missing context are widespread online. Anytime a quote is shared without the surrounding statements, 
or anytime an image is cropped in a manipulative way, that missing context makes the thing that was true into something that can mislead someone. In this case, statistics can have the same problem. I will read this and I want you to think about it. This message says that illegal aliens are far more likely to commit federal crimes based on statistics. They are 7% of the population, yet they commit all these types of crimes at alarming rates, including, according to this statement, 22% of murders. Do you believe this statement is true? You're probably skeptical. But the crime statistics in this meme are actually accurate, as stated, and backed up by government reporting. In this case, careful wording and cherry-picked data lead the reader to a totally false conclusion. The key phrase that makes this statement misleading is federal crimes. Federal crimes make up a very low percentage of crimes nationwide. For instance, there are around 20,000 murders in the U.S. each year, but under 100 federal murder cases. So 22% of federal murder convictions represents fewer than 20 people. Overall, non-citizens make up a much smaller percentage of all criminal prosecutions, but that context is left out. As a result, statements like this can be both true and exceptionally misleading in ways that completely distort the conversation. Next. Faulty logic or logical fallacies are common in misleading messages. In this case, we see a meme that uses a false equivalence argument to question mail-in voting. It argues that if you accept the validity of mail-in voting, the same logic should lead you to accept homemade mail-in vaccination records. But are they really the same? When you vote by mail, you do not send a claim that you voted, you send in your actual voted ballot. It is illogical to compare the two, but this message exploits an underlying skepticism in one thing to challenge the other. Other types of common logical fallacies, such as a red herring or straw man argument, misdirect your attention away from a real problem to an invented one. There are lots of other logical fallacies that show up in our discussions every day. Recognizing them requires breaking down and evaluating the arguments you see. Take a step back and consider whether the argument makes logical sense. Next. Now this meme is framed as just a joke and it doesn't use offensive language or make any factual claims that anyone would take seriously. So how does this contribute to misinformation? Messages like this are designed to reinforce our divisions based on stereotypes of another group's intelligence or character. They make it almost impossible to have an issue-based discussion. In a way, they are versions of the ad hominem and straw man arguments, both forms of faulty logic. In an ad hominem argument, you attack the person you're arguing with instead of addressing their argument. A straw man argument sets up a flimsy or ridiculous version of an opponent's position and then knocks it down. Hate and stereotyping add to misinformation by mocking targeted groups and then dismissing or misrepresenting their positions. Next. Okay, uh, take a look at this meme. This message here sounds like a helpful tip to voters to use their own blue or black pen rather than the pens available at the polls. Many people may pass along this message thinking better safe than sorry. So how is this misinformation harmful? Well, conspiracy theories are harmful because they break down our trust in our usual information sources, often to clear a path for misinformation to spread easily. They often use questioning and innuendo to raise doubts. Conspiracy theories often blame certain politicians, organizations, or wealthy and powerful people for a problem. They suggest that there is hidden information that they don't want you to know. They might imply sinister motives like cheating, greed, or power for keeping the information secret. And conspiracy theories thrive when there is not clear information available to explain a situation. When we think about conspiracy theories, we usually imagine the complicated theories that sound obviously crazy to us, but some, like the one in our example, are simpler and more believable and circulate all the time. 
Anytime you run across signs of conspiracy theories, be skeptical and evaluate the idea carefully. Next. Okay, old and out of date. Social media makes it really easy to confuse something recent with something out of date. It is natural for viewers to assume a posted news story is current and shared articles often don't display the publication date. In this case, a news article from 2012 about voters in Florida was reshared days after the 2018 midterms. The story was from a reputable source and likely true at the time and in the original context. In this example, it even displayed the original date. However, when it was shared six years later in the context of a contentious recount fight in Florida, anyone skimming their newsfeed could easily be left with the impression that this story was contemporary. Checking the date when something was originally published is incredibly easy and a good habit to develop, especially when the substance is inflammatory. Next, uh, Eileen will take a look at some of the reasons misinformation works so well. Why do misleading messages work for us? There are many reasons, but some of the most potent explanations can be useful as we think about how to recognize misinformation when it appears in the wilds of the internet. By learning how we are manipulated, we can develop our own resistance to the manipula manipulation. There are three concepts we'll explore here, motivated reasoning, emotional appeals, and easy answers. Next slide. We are predisposed to believe ideas that align with our own political beliefs and social values. When we learn that someone we don't trust or agree with may have done something bad, we're less likely to question the evidence because we already expect them to be guilty. These biases can also get us into trouble because they condition us to rationalize or ignore things which don't align with our views. When we evaluate what we're reading or hearing, we need to pay particular attention to whether or not the message plays to these biases as we look for and judge the evidence to support the idea. Just because we want something to be true doesn't mean it is. Next slide. Misleading messages often strike an emotional chord with us. Usually they make us angry or fearful, but sometimes they might also make us laugh or be happy or proud. Anytime we encounter a message that triggers a strong emotional response, we have to take a step back and consider why the message makes us feel that way. If those emotions risk clouding our critical thinking, the most effective disinformation campaigns trigger powerful emotions that logic can be difficult to overcome. Next slide. As we discussed early, conspiracy theories frequently offer easy answers to difficult questions. Many types of misleading messages rely on easy answers to get you to jump straight to a particular conclusion. Whether it's about your pocketbook or misinformation, the same advice applies. If it seems to be too good to be true, it probably is. Next slide. Frequently, a message can use two or three of these strategies at the same time. An emotional appeal can be made to make an easy, an easy answer easier to digest. Motivated reasoning can be potent because it also deals with a topic that makes you angry. These are features you will begin to notice appear in many of the misleading messages you encounter. Next slide. The last piece of the landscape we'll look at is the motivation of those who create and purposefully amplify disinformation. Sometimes it's hard to determine a motive behind the misinformation you see, but in some cases it is clear. Looking for obvious motives can be helpful in identifying campaigns of deception and overt efforts to mislead. When discussing misinformation with others, it is helpful to bring up the motives of the content creators because it highlights for them how they might be getting manipulated or exploited. It also encourages them to engage and defend themselves. It's important to focus on the original creator of the message and not question the motive of the people in conversation with you. 
Many bad actors are driven by a political agenda. They spread falsehoods and use the various tactics we have discussed earlier in service of a mission to achieve policy and electoral goals. Electing candidates, passing laws, and shifting public opinion towards the causes they support is their primary objective. We generally assume this is the dominant motive in the corrosive content we observe. However, a large portion of disinformation is actually driven by profit. We often see these messages appear in support of direct funding appeals, product sales, and even efforts to drive traffic to generate advertising revenue. The revenue generated from spreading disinformation continues to grow and diversify. Finally, a subset of bad actors are the trolls who are motivated by the enjoyment they derive from generating disinformation. Trolls are chaos agents who take pleasure in spreading conspiracies and hate simply because it gives them attention and offers an outlet for their frustration. As we look to recognize the various forms of mis- and disinformation that get shared online, it's important to look for clues that might help us to recognize the motivations of the disinformers as well. Understanding those motivations is a valuable way to inoculate against and respond to problematic content. Next slide. Before we move on to responsible engagement, let's briefly recap what we have covered so far. This problem comes in many forms and deploys many distinct tactics. What we see frequently lies in the gray area between truth and lies, and sticks because it plays to our biases, emotions, and desire for easy answers. When it is spread by bad actors, they are motivated by politics, profit, and the thrill of pranks. Let's add one final piece of this problem. We can become part of it if we're not careful. Ruth will explain the, strat will explain the strategies for action. Next slide. Now that we have a clear understanding of the landscape and a detailed overview of what the problem looks like and why it exists, let's start to think about what we can do about it. We'll start by talking about disengaging. A critical rule is in almost all circumstances, you should not engage with mis- and disinformation or the people who create and amplify it. We'll go through a range of ways to think about how and why you should not engage. Then we'll talk about the exceptions, the circumstances when we may want to carefully consider some kind of engagement. From there, we'll talk about the specific ways to think about effectively and responsibly messaging when you need to. Then we will conclude this section by talking about how to use structured conversations to think about more meaningful ways to build bridges with people who believe and share misinformation. Next slide. The first and most important guideline to consider when you find any kind of problematic content on or offline is that you should not engage. The risks and downsides far outweigh any perceived benefits. There may be a personal toll if there is backlash against you or unpredictable social consequences. And critically, your effort to respond can have the opposite of the intended effect and increase the reach and potency of the falsehood you're trying to address. Next slide. If you do engage, you want to avoid some common mistakes we all naturally have a tendency to make. First, you do not want to argue. When you argue directly with someone and try to contradict them, they usually respond defensively and get pushed deeper into their own corner and more fiercely defend their point. Unfortunately, this can actually increase their belief in a misleading concept. In a heated argument, your disagreement can even be seen or felt as evidence in favor of the rumor they believe. Next. Don't amplify. Online, any form of interaction with a falsehood can serve to amplify it. The algorithms that choose which social media content to feed to people don't always care whether a post is getting positive or negative engagement. Some algorithms even favor negative engagement. They take any form of viewing, commenting, and resharing as a signal that they should boost the reach of a piece of mis- or disinformation. 
the last thing you want to do is help more people see something that they wouldn't have otherwise when you were trying to squash or debunk it. Unfortunately, people often become unintentional spreaders of misinformation, even when they are trying to do something good. Next slide. Don't repeat the language of the falsehood. When you try to talk about misleading ideas, disinformation, or conspiracy theories, it is hard to avoid using the language of the people who created them. But it is critical to prevent disinformers from defining the terms of a debate. When a debate occurs, using the disinformers wording allows them to control the terms of the conversation. This is especially important when it comes to the terminology used around the safety and integrity of our elections. You should not repeat the language used by those who seek to undermine the legitimacy of the democratic process. Their effort to define and repeat the terminology is also an effort to normalize the misleading and harmful ideas. The recent reporting on misdated envelopes for mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania is a good example. When a voter forgets to date the outer envelope or accidentally writes in the wrong year, should this really be called an illegal mail-in ballot? Or is it a ballot with errors on the envelope? Agreeing to call clerical mistakes illegal changes the discussion before it even starts. Next slide. Don't embarrass. When you interact with someone in real life or online, you need to be very careful to avoid using words or tactics that might embarrass or ridicule them. Similar to arguing, this usually has the opposite of the intended effect. While you may be frustrated or even shocked that someone else might believe something you feel is absurd or stupid, you cannot convince them otherwise by making them feel bad. And instead, your effort is more likely to backfire and reinforce their beliefs and make you an enemy at the same time. Next slide. Don't contradict with only a fact check. It is common and seems like common sense to respond to misinformation by sharing a fact check. Fact checks and the people that produce them are a critical piece of the effort to counteract and build resilience to mis and disinformation. But some ways of using fact checking sources are more effective than others. Unfortunately, many of the same people who believe or post misinformation are already skeptical of the organizations that produce fact checks and just dismiss them as biased. This is yet another case where the fact check can actually serve as evidence to some that the falsehood they believe is true. From their perspective, if you are relying on an untrustworthy or biased source, that is another strike against your argument and a point in favor of theirs. Responding with a, just a fact check can also come across as condescending. It's like saying, you should have looked that up. It is more effective to read the fact check and think about what it teaches you about the motivations and gaps in knowledge that are exposed by a piece of misinformation. Then you can use this knowledge or the original sources mentioned on the fact-checking site to help you communicate positively about the topic in a way that educates rather than demeans. Next slide. This may seem redundant, and at this point, um, but it, but it can't be stated enough. Before you consider how to respond, you should always consider if you should respond. If you are in doubt about the risks, the answer is always do not engage, do not respond. Now Eileen will explain when and how you can engage effectively in some circumstances. Next slide. Before we talk about how to actually engage responsibly, we need to think about what circumstances make it appropriate to consider attempting to respond. There are a few types of situations where it is helpful to respond. When a rumor, conspiracy theory, or other type of misinformation has already become widely known and discussed throughout the community, that idea may cross a tipping point where the benefit of addressing the issue outweighs the potential harm. Basically, the tipping point comes once it is too late to prevent the message from spreading further. Deciding when, misinf when misinformation has reached a tipping point is subjective. But once misinformation is already circulating widely on multiple social media platforms, 
generating news coverage or is being discussed frequently within a community, it probably deserves a response. Number two, sometimes a particular piece of misinformation pops up to fill in a gap of information or a knowledge gap. This often occurs when there's a legitimate demand for information on a subject that, can only, that you can only find low quality information when you search for it. If you can identify a knowledge gap exposed by problematic content, then that rep represents a good candidate for response. The goal here is to fill that deficit with good information rather than repeating the falsehood, which is both safer and more productive. A good example of a knowledge gap occurred during the 2020 elections when Pennsylvania introduced mail-in voting and new voting machines. People looking for information on how to participate in the 2020 election found a wide variety of misinformation. Some represented honest mistakes from their fellow confused citizens, but knowledge, the knowledge gap also left plenty of room for bad actors to spread disinformation. The LWV responded to this knowledge gap with voter education across several media platforms. Number three, in some cases, you may find yourself in a situation where misinformation creates a concrete obstacle in the real world. Registering voters or participating in the voting process are obvious examples. In these situations, a falsehood may need to be addressed in the moment to actually overcome that obstacle. In these circumstances, it's critical to recall the guidance about how not to engage, particularly the advice about avoiding arguments and embarrassing others. Structured conversations, which we'll talk about in a moment, can be particularly useful in this, these situations. Next slide. Spoiler alert. The following strategies require preparation and thought rather than being off the cuff. Pre-bunking has become a key strategy to combat misinformation. A pre-bunk is a message designed to inoculate someone against a particular misinformation narrative or tactic so that they are more resilient to it, much in the same way that a vaccine inoculates us against a virus. Helping people develop this immunity to misinformation requires carefully identifying, crafting, and communicating a message that can effectively pre-bunk a bad idea without the risk of amplifying it. This set of tips originally designed for journalists is a useful checklist to follow when you want to embark on a pre-bunking as a counter-messaging strategy. Start by figuring out what the data deficit is you want to tackle and carefully choose an example that is easy and safe to communicate. Build your message by starting with the truth. Make sure to warn the audience that you're going to talk about a falsehood. Provide some detail to explain the actual problem you're tackling. Describe the tactic used to mislead and close the message by restating the true information bolstered by the evidence to justify how you know what you know. Make your message simple and shareable and make it available where the people impacted are likely to see it. This is the strategy we used when we created the video journey of an official election ballot in order to fully explain and pre-bunk what happens before, during, and after a voter completes a ballot. This popular vision Video can be found on our quote explainers and graphics webpage, along with all of the other educational resources and web pages we have created at www.lwbpgh.org. Next slide. When the right criteria have been met for engaging in counter messaging and you have a specific problem you need to address. This structure for message can be a useful way to think about designing that communication. It mirrors the tips we just outlined and follows the basic structure. Begin and end your message with facts. Be sure to warn the audience before you describe the problem and make sure to explain how the message is misleading by describing the tactics it uses, the reasons why it's persuasive, and if possible, explain the motives of those who created it. 
Next slide. When circumstances permit, active and structured conversations can be a valuable approach to addressing misinformation within your community, especially when there is more time and possibly the opportunity to engage face to face. A meaningful structured conversation starts with openness and a sincere effort to understand someone else's perspective. Begin by asking questions that help you learn what someone else believes and why those beliefs are important to them. Be sure to show trust and empathy so that you can establish the shared values you have and your honest desire to understand the fears someone else has. As you get into the specifics, maintain a focus on the motives of those who created the messages in question rather than the motives of the person you're speaking with so that you are not alienating them. Be sure to share your own perspective in a way that describes your personal experience, how you learned what you learned, and why you find it meaningful. This structured conversation strategy builds on all of the advice we have reviewed in this counter messaging section. Effective structured conversations avoid arguments and demeaning language. They don't rely solely on the authority of outside voices like news organizations or fact checkers, and instead build on personal experience. This approach can be complicated and doesn't always work in the moment, but when you demonstrate respect and empathy as you communicate, you are more likely to build trust that will have a lasting impact. Eileen and I are going to act out for you a, 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 a structured conversation. So listen as we go through this conversation for some of these strategies um, that we just listed. Isn't it awful that today's generation is being taught to hate the country? Wow, I'm not sure I know what you mean. What makes you think that? I saw on the news that schools are teaching kids to criticize America. Even some parents don't want their children to be patriotic. Wow, I'll have to guess that you mean you disagree with the people that you disagree with politically, like me, are teaching their kids to hate the country. Is that what you mean? Yeah, you see it everywhere. Well, if I believed that, I would probably be pretty upset too. But from my own experience, I really don't agree that this is happening. Well, maybe some are not teaching the children to hate the country, but are not teaching children to love the country like they used to. Maybe, but don't you think the news stories like this are just trying to get us to fight with each other? That's possible but I still feel that my patriotic values are under attack. Can I share a story with you? My own experience working in schools makes me feel that most people are teaching their children to love our country, but we just have different ways of talking about it, especially if we're on different sides of the aisle. Maybe, but I still feel that I can't say what I think without some people jumping down my throat. I hear you on that. Wouldn't it be great if we could just talk to each other instead of making cartoon villains out of the other side all the time? It sure would. I guess I agree with that. Okay, so notice that in this conversation, no one won and no one lost. The speakers did not come to an agreement on the original point of whether or not kids are being taught to hate the country. Instead, they came to a better understanding of the emotions and experiences behind the other person's perspective. By asking questions, showing empathy, and telling personal stories, they became more connected instead of more divided. This leaves room for both to consider the other's point of view later, in private, without feeling defensive. And most importantly, it leaves the door open for future conversations. Okay, next slide. Oh, back one. Uh oh. Sorry, okay. give me one second. I uh, got slide it all. thirty six. Just, yep, just give me one sec. I was so close. <laughs> slide thirty six. I think. Thirty five. Okay. Um, it's not. It's not sharing. No, I know. Just give me okay. one second. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. The last portion of our training is about what you can do 
as soon as today to help build resilience to misinformation for yourself and contribute to your community. Effectively spotting mis- and disinformation when you see it online or in your community is a skill that requires practice. Learning to do it quickly and accurately takes time and effort. The League of Women Voters has partnered with the Algorithmic Transparency Institute on a program called the Civic Listening Corps to give you the opportunity to find and report problematic content when you see it so that you can exercise these new skills and so that you can benefit broader efforts to combat misinformation across the country. Next slide. The Civic Listening Corps program continues the training you have begun today by going into greater detail on the common forms and tactics used to spread misinformation. This volunteer program operates on a shift-based model where you sign up to commit one or more hours to dedicate to the task of listening to the discourse in your own social media feeds or elsewhere online to find instances of problematic content that are circulating. You then flag that content and submit it to a shared database and describe the problem you identified with it. Next slide. Over time, by participating in this process, you can help achieve multiple goals at once. The act of finding and flagging problematic content helps you build the resilience we seek directly, both for yourself and your community. You learn to recognize common types of messages and gain an awareness of the most recent and popular strategies used to mislead people. This makes you less susceptible yourself and it arms you with knowledge and personal experience that you can use to communicate with others to share your resilience. At the same time, you will benefit the broader community of organizations working together to combat mis- and disinformation by sharing what you see locally with others all across the country to establish a foundation of situational awareness that can support communications and inoculation messaging. By systematically identifying and documenting the problems we encounter, we are able to discover misinformation patterns and trends that help to focus actions. Bad actors can be exposed and the social media platforms that enable them to amplify falsehoods can be held accountable. Participating in the Civic Listening Corps gives you the opportunity to participate in realizing the vision of a whole of society response to combating mis- and disinformation. Next slide. There are two ways you can start to participate today. First, you can take out your mobile phone right now, open the camera app, and point it at this QR code. When you scan it, your device will ask you if you would like to add the League of Women Voters tip line to your address book. If you do so, you will essentially bookmark these contacts on your device. Then the next time you encounter something problematic online, you will have an instant way to flag that content into this shared data database. As you scroll through any social media app, you can choose to click the share button for something you found online that looks problematic. But instead of amplifying it within the platform, you can share it via text message to this tip line you just added to your address book on your device so that our community is made aware of it. The second way you can participate is by signing up to join the League's efforts at the Civic Listening Corps. Visit this link in your browser or phone and confirm your interest and you'll be invited to the next Civic Listening Corps training and get updates on listening shifts that you can sign up for. By actively participating in this process, you can help the League understand and combat the misinformation that is affecting your community and likely other communities as well. And this, um, this address is not only here, um, but it's also on our website. I'll sh tell you where to find it. Um, next slide, please. This slide gives a list of the resources, of some of the resources, resources that were used to create this presentation. Many of them are also available on our website at www.lwvpgh.org slash disinfo. And that um, link is also listed on the slide there in additional resources. You can, on that web page, you can view a previously recorded version of this presentation. And the slide deck is also available for downloading if you would like to give the presentation to another group. We also have a lot of the content that we covered tonight 
listed on the page and you can go there uh, to review something that you wanted to look into further and we have lists of extra resources all throughout the page. Um, next slide, that's it for us, I think, and wanted to thank you for coming and for uh, participating in this project with us. Thank you so much, ladies, that was incredible. Um, and so now uh, I wanted to, you know, thank you for, for your wonderful presentation. Um, thank you for those who are still here for uh, attending tonight um, to hear all this information. Um, I always find I learn something new at these webinars, which is why they're kind of my favorite, don't tell anybody else, but like my favorite uh, uh, after, after school events to go to with the league. Um, so now I'll open it up to questions. Um, audience members, please feel free to continue asking questions using that Q&A function. Um, and I will read them out so that we can get them all answered. Um, even though that was so informative, there might not be any questions at all. I feel like you answered any question I was having. Um, Joan, yes, I will be emailing out a recording um, and the slide deck as well to all participants later on. Joan asked if the transcript would be available. So I'll be sending that out after. <clears throat> um, and if anybody else has any questions, please put them in the Q&A function right now. Um, the only question, if I'll give it a second to see if anyone from the, I mean, of the attendees have a question, but I was wondering, um, you know, you, I know you, you, you ladies have are so well versed in having these conversations. And I guess Mike, I had a question, which was, what advice would you give to people who, you know, are having to have these maybe with have these conversations, maybe with like family or close friends who kind of that adds an extra level of exhaustion onto it. So I guess, how would you what are your tips for like avoiding this kind of burnout that we all feel, I think, in sort of pushing back against this all the time? I think there are circumstances and situations where you might feel confident to um, engage, but I, I would prepare myself, particularly with family, if you have a particular relative or close friend who you know their viewpoint and you know they're gonna bring it up in certain situations. I'd prepare myself ahead of time with some tips and ideas about how to respond and, and sort of practice in your head, you know, doing it without, because these, generally speaking, some of the, some people are so set in what they believe that no matter what you say, you're not gonna change your mind. But if you feel like you need to say something, I would uh, rehearse it. I would get prepared ahead of time and tell yourself to stay calm. And, and besides trying to do a, a prepared script and predict what the conversation is going to be like, what you can do is kind of learn a, a handful of phrases that help you steer the conversation back on track. And we do have um, we do have a list of those on our on our web page. I don't know if you would like me to share the web page and you could see some of the resources that we have if, if I could share my screen. Sure, we can also, I think we put it in the chat as well so people can look. Um, we do have another question as well that I'd wanna make sure we have time to get to. Um, okay. Jan asked if there's any other way to compact the impact of algorithms other than not engaging. It depends on the platform. There are some platforms that allow you to downvote something. Um, that and muting or blocking the sender will sometimes send a signal that that's not what you want to see. Um, but in almost every social media platform, even if you if you if you're arguing, if you're saying, "Well, this isn't true," or or if you hit a dislike type of a button, it just they just want attention. They just want attention. Mm -hmm. And there are lots Thank of bots so out there just trying to get you to argue even, like just trying to make you <laughs> argue back and forth. It's, it's exhausting sometimes. At least I think that would feel like it is. Um, well, wonderful. I don't see any other questions, which isn't super surprising given that that was so informative. It was awesome. Um, and I will be sending out all of the links that Greater Pittsburgh, the 
that Ruth and Eileen mentioned to their website because the Greater Pittsburgh Leagues website is just fantastic and has so much information. So I'll make sure to send that out um, to all of the registrants. It's also on our website linked to their website. Um, oh, one more question before we close it out. Um, and then for our last question before we close it out, Ron Bandis just asked that, or he noted that a common tactic of people in the bubble is to pivot to a different argument, such as illustrating that others have maybe engaged in the same activity. How do you keep the conversation on track and should you be, should you keep the conversation on track? I think you should. I think that situation you can challenge it directly and say something to the effect. I think you're changing the subject, but it is a common argumentative tactic and it's really a hard one for when when somebody's very practiced at it, it really is hard. And I think at that point you might want to disengage um, because it's just going to send you down a rabbit hole sometimes. I mean, the, that is being done a great deal at this point. I'd like to say that um, those of us, Ruth and I and Amy Cleesis, who is part of this presentation and was not able to participate for a family emergency, we're all available for consultation or even if you want us to come to your league and do this presentation. We're also, we've been talking about um, making it, trying to make it so that just it's better presented to an, a regular audience. I'd like to be able to see it presented to younger audiences because they're the ones that are really on social media all the time and reading it. And so I'd like to see us trying to prepare a version that would go over with high schools. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. So, oh, Ruth, did you have any um, anything to add? I was just I was just going to say that some of the groups that contributed to this original presentation have detailed um, in person training and practice sessions for having these in person conversations. And again, if you look at the at the, our, our web page, um, you'll find uh, many many resources like that where you can go online and and practice with people having these types of conversations and learning some of the skills. It's really hard to do on the fly. It really is right. without a lot of practice. Awesome. Thank you so much. There's so much, there's so many, there's so much good information out there that it's also important to highlight that as well. Um, and just so we are, you know, being respectful of everybody's time, um, I'm going to gently close out our Q&A session um, and turn it back over to Rochelle Kaplan um, to close us out. Rochelle? Well, thank you, Sam. And oh my heavens, Eileen and Ruth, you just blew me away once again. I learned more than I did the first time. And this was stupendous. I know that I am one of these people that feel like they have to give everybody the facts. Maybe that's my legal background. So this was a reminder to disengage, be quiet, and uh, not feel the need to do that. But when I close it out, I just want to tell everyone a reminder about the jewel of the League of Women Voters. It's called Vote 411. If you want to get accurate candidate information, you just have to put in your address and you will get candidate information. This year, all of the local leagues are putting in their municipal candidate information. The state's just responsible for the appellate judicial races. But also, this is one-stop shop. It will give you your polling location, um, where to go register, where to drop your mail ballot off of if your county has drop boxes. Um, your deadlines for mailing in your ballot. Speaking of deadlines, October 23rd, last day to register. October 31st, last day to apply for a mail-in ballot. November 7th, you go to your precincts to vote or you make sure your mail-in ballot is at your precinct. I also want to remind people about our two ballot box basics. Next week, September 20th, 
Deborah Gross, who's the executive director of Pennsylvania's for Modern Court, is going to talk about the judiciary and the importance of these judicial elections. In some counties, we also have trial court or common pleas level uh, judicial races and magisterial races, as well as these appellate court races. And then October 10th, we're going to have a webinar on the structure of local governments. Pat Christmas, who is our policy, who is the policy officer of the Committee of 70 and knows all about local governments and is another terrific presenter, is going to be providing us with that ballot box basic. So join us. If you can't join us, we will have a recording. And I want to thank everyone for attending and have a great evening. Thank you all so much. Please expect a follow-up email um, tomorrow with all this information. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.